I'm going to talk about uh, three invasive pests that have come into our area. I'm going to start off uh, with the first one, which is probably going to be the most important. And then the next one is uh, it's going to be somewhat important. And then finally the third one is only important if you grow a certain crop. And we'll discuss that when I get to that third one. Um, uh, all these have come in um, in the last uh, two or three years. This one right here, the spotted wing drosophila. How many have heard of the spotted wing drosophila? Oh, okay, not many of you. How many people have any kind of fruit? Okay, uh, any blackberries, raspberries, anything like that? Strawberries? How many strawberry growers? Okay. Uh, this uh, particular pest is going to be a, a problem in uh, all your uh, small fruit and uh, somewhat in your uh, strawberries, but we're not quite sure with the strawberries, but I'll discuss that as we go along here. Okay, uh, the spotted wing uh, drosophila is a vinegar fly. Uh, I, I normally would call these a fruit fly, and I think most other people would call them a fruit fly. They look like fruit fly, but technically they're called vinegar flies. So uh, guess what kind of smell they're attracted to? Oh, very good, excellent. They're called vinegar flies because they like things that are, are starting to rot and starting to break down. And that's sort of what we term fruit flies because fruit flies are usually around things that are rotting, starting to break down, and that's where they lay their eggs. And they, once, they, once they lay the eggs, eggs hatch and they start to feed on that rotting material. Uh, but this is uh, a, a different species, uh, Drosophila suzukii. Uh, uh, it's closely related to Drosophila melanogaster, and uh, that's the one that we probably see around our fruit all the time. If you've got bananas that have been sitting a little bit too long and you have a little fly flying around it, it's probably this Drosophila right here. And we're going to see what makes this Drosophila so much different and where it's come from. All right. This is what the uh, fly looks like up close. This is the male right here. The female, well, I'll show you here in a second, does not have any spots on its wing. Okay? So you see where it gets its name, spotted wing. Okay? Entomologists are nothing more than clever, if nothing else. So they, they like to give real common names to things like spotted wing or blue-bellied something or something like that. So this is, has two large spots on its wing. Uh, there's nothing uh, else uh, magical about the, these males. Uh, this is about the only thing. The males are not the problem. The females are. Uh, one problem you might run into if you start catching these and you're interested in uh, monitoring for these uh, this year on your farm. I, I did not bring it in with me today, but I have it out in my truck, uh, traps. So anybody's interested in a trap, well, I can give you a tr two or three traps if you want. You only have to supply the bait, which is real inexpensive. So you, know, you might want to think about that as I go through this. Uh, but there are other flies, uh, Drosophila flies, that you can see have spots in their wings. And a lot of times what you'll see in these traps, that's why I'm getting to the traps, is a, a mess of uh, Drosophila, uh, uh, vinegar flies, in these traps. And so what, you need, what you're going to need to do is pick out the, the ones that are uh, spotted wing and the ones that aren't because the ones that are not spotted wing aren't going to give you any problem. Only the ones that are spotted wing, only this one species is going to give you some problems. And it just takes a little bit of practice, you'll get used to it. And you can see one right here, and you can see the spots on its wings. And so you'll be able to pick that out fairly easily. If you look, here's another one with the spots on its wing, here's another one. Uh, what, what I found is, uh, on the, uh, eastern sh on the western shore of, of Maryland, all through the west, uh, western part of the state, central part of the state, and the southern part of the state, we found this fly. And we just found it this year. Um, and every farm that we looked for, it, uh, we did find it. And every farm that we did find it, it, every time the grower said, I do not have a problem with this particular pest. And in every farm, we, ha we found it. So that, that tells you it's well disguised and the, the damage it does is well disguised and a lot of time you're not going to recognize it, you're just going to pass it off as some other kind of damage. 
when in fact the, the fly is, is increasing in numbers. Okay, there's other species of Drosophila that sort of look like spotted wing, and this is another species, and this is another, but you see the, the spots on this one is probably the closest uh, to spotted wing, but you can see it's a little bit further up on the wings, while these are a little bit further back and a little larger. Uh, if, you, if you do have a trap and you are trapping uh, and you have any questions about whether or not you have spotted wing, you can always uh, bring it to your uh, county educator. Shannon will be glad to identify it for you. Uh, or you can send it to me, either one. Uh, well, again, once you start looking at these and somebody picks, points them out to you a couple times, you'll be able to recognize them fairly easily. Okay, this is the, the real problem we have right here. This is the female spotted wing Drosophila. You can see she has no spots on her wings. So you cannot tell a female uh, spotted wing from a, a non-spotted wing female, okay? So they all look the same. The, the, the secret with the spotted wing is right down here. And this is her ovipositor. And her ovipositor is much more sclerotized, and that just means it's much more heavily armored. It's much thicker than the other uh, uh, vinegar flies and she's able to cut her way into fruit that is not uh, damaged at all or is not rotting. And so this is the other uh, vinegar fly that's closely related uh, to Drosophila suzukii. And you see that the ovipositors look very similar, but this one is much heavier than this one. And you see the female right here, she's taking her ovipositor and she's actually making a saw mark into the fruit. And so this fruit is not ripened yet. This fly and all the rest of the Drosophila flies cannot penetrate hard fruit. They cannot penetrate fruit unless it's already started to rot. And most of the time they just lay their eggs right on top of the rotted fruit because the egg will wiggle its way in, in into that area a little bit. It'll hatch and it'll begin to feed on that rotted fruit. And that's because the fruit is so rotted it, it really doesn't put up much of a uh, barrier for the eggs to penetrate into it. So this is why she is such a pest. She's able to cut into fruit that's just starting to ripen. So if you have something like blackberries, she'd start to lay her eggs when the blackberries just started to turn red, just started to get some color to them, but well before they had any kind of ripeness to them. Okay. This is what a Drosophila egg looks like, and all Drosophila eggs look very similar to this. They have these two hairs that are hanging out the back, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And this is where a, a regular Drosophila would lay her eggs, is right on the surface. This is where a spotted wing Drosophila lays her eggs, is inside the fruit. And so that egg is going to be much more protected than uh, the other eggs that are laid on top. Okay. This is the egg inside. This is uh, the, the, the two tubes I was talking about, two hair-like tubes. And these tubes are actually breathing tubes. And a lot of times, the reason they have breathing tubes is because uh, the eggs are oviposited or laid in rotting fruit. And if you've ever been in rotting fruit, you know it doesn't have any oxygen in it or it doesn't have very much. The oxygen's all taken up because of the rotting organisms are using that to decay the fruit very rapidly. So there's no oxygen left. And so in order for these eggs to get oxygen, they had to put out these little uh, uh, periscopes, if you will, snorkels, and uh, put it up above the fruit and get their oxygen that way. Okay. So you probably won't see any of these eggs uh, when you're looking. They're very small, and the Drosophila itself is very small. Uh, but in case you ever see anything, and you see these two hairs that look like they're sticking out from the fruit, that's what it is. All right, this is the larvae. This is the immatures. The eggs hatch. And this is what they hatch into. They basically hatch into maggots. And you can see that this one maggot and the one uh, angle of the shot, you can see this little tube right here. And that's the same sort of thing. It, these maggots can move around inside the rotting fruit and they'll run out of oxygen eventually. And so they'll take that little tube and they'll shove it above the uh, surface of the fruit and they'll bring in oxygen and then they'll go back into the fruit. So this way, they don't, the rest of their body does not have to be above the fruit. They can just send that little uh, periscope up and get some oxygen. Okay. All right, now we'll look at the life cycle. Uh, spotted wing Drosophila, as, as most uh, Drosophila, overwinter as adult, usually adult females. Uh, they prefer moderate, cool, or wet climates. 
and we're going to find that uh, these wet climates are real important as to whether or not they're going to be a pest in your particular fruit. Okay, adults live for about one to two months, so there's a very fast turnover of these. There could be 10, 12 generations a year in our area. And does anybody know what happens or what is more likely to happen when you have a lot of generations in one year? What is that pest able to be able to do as far as pesticides are concerned? Anybody? Adapt, okay, good. They're able to become resistant to pesticides. And so that's what we're, we're fearing about this uh, spotted wing drosophila, is that there's only, there's four or five pesticides that, uh, only one of which is organic. And so we're afraid that um, these pesticides are gonna be overused and these flies are gonna become uh, quickly uh, resistant to most of the pesticides. And when that happens, we're gonna be in real trouble. They're already real difficult to control even with pesticides. Okay, so the adults live for a very short period of time. Females can lay two to 600 eggs in a fruit. And she starts to do that as soon as it starts to turn color. But she prefers that there be a, a larger sugar content in that fruit. So as the fruit shows more color and begins to ripen up more and more, she will lay more and more of her eggs. And her eggs and her larvae are, are better able to compete inside that fruit than the other Drosophila species. So they get an earlier start by, the, by uh, putting their eggs in the fruit just as it starts to color up. And then even when they start at the same time, their larvae are more able to survive than other Drosophila larvae. Okay, eggs hatch in one to three days, larvae feed in the fruit for about five to seven days, then they pupate for anywhere to four to 15 days. That four days is probably what happens in August, so it's a very quick turnaround period. Okay, they tend to overwinter along the, in woods and woods edge, and so this is the areas they're gonna come out of. Uh, if you saw the earlier uh, presentation by Sarudi Hooks on brown marmorate stink bug, you'd see that this is the same place that brown marmorate stink bug overwinter is in the woods. And so this fly overwinters in the same spot. And so they're gonna come out of these woods uh, during the early part of the season and start to infest your crop. So what's ever closest to the woods is more likely going to be infested. All right, these are some uh, trap catches. I started uh, tra trap catching in uh, August. Uh, we didn't know we had the, the uh, pest on any of our farms in uh, Western Maryland. And this is uh, Western Maryland, somewhere uh, around Frederick, uh, a little bit east of that. Um, uh, it, on a lot of our um, farms that produce uh, fruit. Uh, it's a, -pick op a lot of you pick operations in that particular area of the state. So uh, I went out there and started putting the traps out in these different areas. I put them out in woods. I put them out in areas near the woods, but not up, to, not in the woods. Then in non-crop areas. These are places like parking lots and, and the stand itself that sells the fruit and things like that. Just see where the flies are going. And these are blackberries, cherry trees, raspberries, apples, strawberries, blueberries, and pumpkins. And you see in August, we have very high numbers on uh, these uh, couple particular farms in the blackberries and the raspberries. And these are their two favorite fruit, blackberries and raspberries. Uh, if you don't have blackberries and raspberries, they'll, they'll take something else and use it. But if you have blackberries and raspberries, that's what they're gonna go to in really high numbers. Uh, also, well, they were found in uh, blueberries, uh, not in real high numbers, but in, in uh, moderate numbers. Okay, this is September. You see the numbers still, if you look over here at the side, this is how many we've found in, per trap per week. And so you can see the number's still high even in September, and it's still high in blackberries and raspberries. Even though in, in September, most of the raspberries are done, we still have some blackberries being picked, but not many. Most of the growers that I dealt with that had these kind of populations uh, abandoned their fields. It's not so much that the damage was really bad, it's because uh, when you start to harvest the, these uh, berries and put them in a, a little container and then take them up to the fruit stand, oftentimes what will happen, the maggots will start to come out. 
And so you have maggots crawling around on your fruit when somebody wants to go buy it. It usually is not a real good temptation for them to go buy it. Okay? The other thing is, a lot of times these people, <clears throat> and this is why they abandoned the field, they sold these, these containers of the fruit, they took them home, they ate some, they put them in a the refrigerator, and that cold in the refrigerator just drove the maggots out of the fruit by the hundreds. And so they go back in there the next morning to look at their berries and they have maggots all over the fruit. Okay? Again, not very happy customers. And so this is, this is the big problem. This is why they abandoned the field. They could not tell what some of the, uh, the berries were infested and which berries were not until they had to open it. Okay? And that's, that's the trouble with the damage. The damage sometimes uh, oftentimes you cannot recognize it. And so you, you have people out there picking the berries and putting them in, in a container and they're bringing them up to the store. And these are people who have a lot of experience. And these are you pick operations. So a lot of the people who don't have as much experience as these other people are just picking berries and not realizing there may be one that's not quite ripe or quite right. And they end up with a lot of uh, berries that are infested. So this is one of the big uh, problems with them is that they infest berries and it's difficult to see if they infested this berry until it's too late and somebody's munching on it. And you see in September, they start to, mirror, start to move towards the woods. So the, the area near the woods, around the woods, are starting to become higher and higher in their population. Then in October, areas around the woods start to become higher in population. The area in the woods become higher in population but I'm still picking them up in blackberries and raspberries, but now all of a sudden I'm picking them up in uh, apples and apple trees. Why do you think I'm picking them up in apple trees in late October? Anybody wanna guess? You didn't know you'd have to participate this afternoon, did you? Very good, excellent. Rotted fruit on the ground. This is what they're going after in these orchards. And, a lot, and you pick places have a tendency to have more rotted fruit than uh, maybe a place that doesn't, that, that is not you pick. So the more rotted fruit on the ground, the more these flies are gonna come in. They still act just like regular Drosophila flies, uh, fruit flies. They still wanna go for rotting fruit. And so that's what makes them so difficult. They're able to survive quite nicely on rotted fruit Okay, uh, but they're also able to switch over to fruit that is not rotten. So they can go back and forth. Okay, also uh, you see that their numbers have really come up in pumpkins. And again, this is late, more late towards late October. Anybody wanna guess what's happening in pumpkins late October? He already said it once, but you can see. Rot rotted pumpkins, that's right. If you go out to these rotted pumpkin fields and you see some of these rotting pumpkins, and you take a sweep net right near the rotting pumpkins, you'll come about a third of all the uh, vinegar flies are spotted wing on these farms, that have spotted wing on their farm. So these spotted wing can spread out and go to a lot of different places and start to reproduce in large numbers. And most of the time, no one's gonna care that they're on rotted fruit. And so their numbers be, are able to continue to climb and increase, even though their main things that they feed on uh, like blackberries and raspberries ha are done for the season, but their population continues to increase. Th that's what makes them difficult. In November, now we starting to, I'm starting to pick them up more in uh, raspberries, apples, uh, blackberries, and now in woods, their numbers have really gone up in the woods and near woods. Still high in pumpkins, uh, uh, still somewhat in cherries, and again, it's because the cherries are rotting out in the uh, field. Okay, in December, I'm still picking up adults in my traps. These traps are only uh, collect adults, only adults that, that can fly. And I'm still picking them up in blackberries and raspberries. That's not a real good sign, okay? So if we look at all of these, you can see how the numbers started off around uh, 140, 120, kept there all through September, October, then they were cut in half, and then they're cut in half again in December. So the numbers are going down, but the amazing thing is they're still pretty high, even in December. So I was real curious to see what was gonna happen in January and February. So their numbers are really reduced in January, but they're still there, and they're still in blackberries and raspberries. I'm still catching them in blackberries and raspberries. 
So that tells you they're not going to the woods to overwinter. They're staying in the blackberry and raspberry fields. And as soon as these fields start to have fruit that starts to turn color, they're going to start to reinfest it in large numbers. Okay. All right, February, the numbers are starting to go back up. And again, raspberries and blackberries. So th they're active. They were active all through this winter. And this, of course, this is a winter that we never had. And, uh, so we're curious as to what their number is going to be. Now, this past year, we saw their numbers really high in August. And they probably weren't that high in June. But uh, we don't know when they got here. We don't know how they overwintered. We don't know a lot of different things about them. So we know they overwintered pretty well in our area this year. And we know they overwintered in the crop that they infested. And so they're going to be ready to go next year. So that's what has us kind of worried, especially out in something like strawberries. Because these flies will start to come out and be active in April. So they're going to, they come out real early, a little bit earlier than other vinegar flies, and they start to lay eggs. Okay, this is the type of damage they can do. This is on blackberries. And you see, you don't see any wiggly uh, things crawling out of these, and you're not going to. Uh, you have to really break these open. You have to look pretty hard for them because they're, they're, oftentimes they are clear or white, and they'll look just like the juice that you're, you're squeezing. And so you won't be able to see any. But it just looks like some of the berries are maybe rotting a little bit early for some reason. A lot of people attributed that to the heat we had. And the heat was a problem this year for the berries uh, rotting a little bit too quickly. And on raspberries, it's even a little more subtle. Uh, just sort of a, a, a few uh, collapsed droplets on the fruit. And if you tear open these, uh, the fruit, you see that they, they've been feeding on the center of the fruit. And so you often see a damage to the center of it. And here you see one that's perfectly healthy. And here are two vinegar flies on it right there. And that sort of gives you a, a size of how big these vinegar flies are. They're very tiny and they're hard to see the, the, the spotted wings unless you have some kind of uh, 10x uh, hand lens. Okay, this is the damage on cherry. And you see, you see a lot more overpositioning damage on cherries. You see one right here, 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 and you see a bunch right here. And so that, again, that's the female turning around using her uh, saw-like ovipositor, uh, dr drilling a hole into the cherry and then laying her eggs inside that cherry. But the good thing about this is at least you know that the fly's been here and it's infested the fruit. If we look back here, you don't see any of that. You don't see any of that damage on, uh, on any of the uh, blackberries or raspberries. Okay. This is on strawberry, and it's right here. And it just looks like a little bruise. It's something you might not pay much attention to if you saw it. Uh, but if you open up the fruit, uh, then you, you get the maggots. Okay, and they're going to start to rot this fruit maybe a week, two weeks earlier than it normally would have rotted. So uh, they do go into strawberries. Uh, we just don't know how bad yet. This is in blueberries. Again, you see a little bit more damage to the blueberries. So things like blueberries and cherries, uh, you have a tendency to see more damage to the skin than you do f some of the other fruit, the softer fruit. That's, Seems that the ovipositor will go in, and then the, that fruit will close up around that ovipositor scar, and you don't see it. But you see some the, the overposition spot right here, and then all around right here. And these are actually right here. These are uh, uh, pupae. The, the larvae have pupated inside the fruit. So you can see this fruit is still fairly well intact, or at least it looks intact. So somebody could uh, easily buy that and then get pupae uh, for their breakfast, too. Uh, just to let you know, when I was out in these fields, I knew were heavily infested in these raspberry fields, and I was looking for the flies and doing stuff. I ate the raspberries. Okay? I knew they were infested with maggots. Okay? It doesn't matter. I, you, you don't taste them, and you get a little extra protein. You can tell your customers that. But it, it, it's not going to hurt you. Okay? But it, it is creepy if you start seeing them crawling out while you're feeding on them. Are you eating them? Okay, hosts. Now these are fields that we found heavy infestations, or at least a heavy infestation has been found in the past. And that's in raspberry, blackberry, cherry, blueberry, strawberry, boysenberry, nectarines, and Japanese plum. We also 
I shouldn't say we, but the field infestation is also found in grape, even apple, pears, plum, and peach. Now, these down here, well, the reason I separated them is because these aren't great hosts, and so we don't think they're going to go to them to any great extent, but we're just not sure. So that's one of the things that we, we need to watch. So if you have any of these fruit on your farm, you'll need to watch for a spotted wing drosophila this year. Okay. Okay, overwinters, adults in the woods, we talked about that. It's active throughout the season. It prefers high humidity and moderate temperatures in the mid-70s. So it doesn't like it real hot, it doesn't like it real cold, but it still remains active. That's what I want you to understand. Overposition, that means laying eggs stops below 50 degrees and above 90 degrees. So when we get real hot during the summer, they're not going to overposit anymore. Okay? And overwinters even in harsh conditions. And I'll show you uh, where it originated from and some of the places where it originated from are, have extremely hard uh, winters. Oh, here we are. Okay. <clears throat> what this map shows is the potential for this particular fly uh, to do well in a particular area. So the more red or orange an area is, the better this fly is going to do. And this is where it originated from, is Southeast Asia, okay, China. And you see up here in Korea and Japan, all the blue dots means it has been found in these areas in fairly good numbers. So. They're predicting it's going to do well in Malaysia, and it's extremely hot down there, and yet they're still predicting it'll do well. They haven't found it quite yet down there, but they expect it to spread down in that area. But you can see most of the area it's concentrated in is what? Is a more temperate zone area, and that's exactly like what we have. Okay? So these are the areas where it's doing well, and it's doing well in South Korea. South Korea has bitter winters much worse winters than we have. Their, their, their winters are more like uh, up in Minnesota. So their winters are bad and the fly is doing quite well up there. All right, this is the United States. The same sort of thing is a predictive map about where it's gonna do well. It first hit the uh, uh, east, uh, west coast of the United States, all along California, Oregon, and Washington. And then it turned up over here in Michigan, uh, first in Florida, and then uh, North Carolina, then Virginia, and then Michigan, and then Pennsylvania, and now it's in uh, Maryland, and it's in Delaware. So haven't, they haven't updated this map. But where's the area in this country where, we don't, where it's predicted not to do well? Yes, right here, okay? And why do you think it's not predicted to do well in that part of the country? What, what is different about this part of the country than this part of the country? Very good, it's dry. This is a very dry area. And so the fly does not do well in very dry areas. It does very well in very wet, humid areas, which is exactly what we have. So we think it's gonna do pretty well, and it's in these states right now, and it's just gonna to spread to all these other states. All right. These are different traps that you can use, and the trap that I would give you today looks uh, very much like this, but without the yellow card in it. Uh, the one I use is this one over here. Uh, you can purchase it from a company. The reason I like it, it's very small, it's easy to handle. Uh, I get consistent results with it. It does a very good job of capturing the flies. It doesn't capture as many as, as this one or this one, but proportionally for its size, it captures just as many, okay? Uh, the, the most important thing down here is, is the bait you use. And the bait you wanna use is apple cider vinegar, okay? It has to be apple cider vinegar. It can't be regular vinegar. It has to be apple cider vinegar because you need that little bit of the apple pieces to rot a little bit in that vinegar and that gives off a, a aroma of fruit and that's what the fly picks up on, okay? So the apple cider vinegar, it's really cheap. You can get a half gallon of it for like four or five bucks and that'll probably last you all season. Uh, you don't need to store it in a refrigerator. You can just put it in any, any old place. It's not going to hurt it if it gets too hot, or too warm, or too cold. I've had it in the back of my truck all summer and all winter, and it does a fine job. So we're lucky in the sense that uh, this, these traps do work well, and this bait does work well in attracting the flies. With brown marmorite stink bug, if, if Surudi talk, talked about this, 
uh, there is no way that we can monitor for it because we do not have a good trap that will bring this, uh, the, the uh, bug in, into a field so we know whether or not it's present. But with these, this is about the only way you can tell if you have the fly, is once you capture them, and you check about every four or five days or every week, depending on how many flies you've got, uh, and you see if you see any spotted wings, that's the easiest way. Look for the spotted wings. If you don't see any spotted wings, it might be a lot of females. I noticed during the season there's more females than males. Some, some parts of the season there's more males than females, so it goes back and forth. But you're almost always going to have some males in these traps. So you're always going to have some with spotted wings, which are fairly easy to, uh, to distinguish from other flies. Okay. Uh, the other thing they're attracted to the flies are a red color. So that's another reason I like this trap, because it has red color. These don't. Okay, you want to put the traps uh, inside where the fruit is. You don't want to put it out away from the fruit. Put it in where the fruit is. <coughs> Excuse me. And put it with as much foliage around it as possible, so that you actually can't see it very well. And the flies like to go to places that are cool and, and uh, a little damp. So they'll prefer to go into the traps that are inside the foliage rather than anything outside they're not going to go into. Okay, <clears throat> now these are some things you can do organically to control it. Uh, sanitation, this is probably one of the biggest things, is remove mature fruit or overripe fruit. Now that's going to be a pain. But, uh, it, if you do have this fly, and the traps will tell you whether or not you have the fly, then you need to remove as much mature and overripe fruit as possible. And you need to destroy it, okay? Uh, sanitation, eliminate alternate habitats, and that's going to be difficult. Uh, any, but any called fruit or rotting fruit in any other field, they're going to go over there, as we saw with the pumpkins and the apples and the cherries that are laying on the ground, and they're going to reproduce on those and then come back to your other fruit. Okay, so you need to, so the whole thing is trying to clean up your area as much as possible. Another thing is monitoring trapping to quickly detect infestations. As I said earlier in the talk, uh, every farm we visited had the fly, and every farm we visited, the grower said they didn't have the fly. Okay? And so it's one of those things, I'm not sure if it's wishful thinking. If I wish I, don't, I didn't have the fly, I won't have the fly. But uh, it's one of those things that they weren't used to looking for this damage, and suddenly the damage uh, did appear. And once I started to point it out to them, they started to notice the damage in other places, in other fields. And then when we started to see how many flies they were uh, having on their farm, you know, anywhere from 50 to 150 per uh, week, uh, that's a tremendous number of flies. Okay? So monitoring is real important. And you guys have a good chance now that the rest of the state knows it's infested, that here on the eastern shore, uh, the fly has not moved in to any great extent, but it will, because you guys are going to be nice and moist all through the season. So it's going to do a better job of surviving out here than it does on the western shore. Okay, you can use insecticidal sprays to suppress the fly. And uh, the one uh, that will reduce damage is in trust. It's about the only organic pesticide that's going to work to reduce the damage. So. You're going to have to try to do as much sanitation as possible. If you do have the fly, and what this is going to do, what the entrust is going to do, it's not going to kill the flies to any great extent. And that's something my trapping has shown uh, over the uh, August and September. The, the growers I was working with were spraying like crazy, and these were synthetic growers. And so they were spraying malathion and uh, uh, pyrethroids and things like that. And the fly counts just went like this. They never really went down. You can't get rid of the fly, okay? It's not possible. And I stress this, growers sort of laugh at me, and then they just keep going, and then they find out they can't get rid of the fly. So you can't get rid of the fly once it's on your farm in large numbers. Okay? And that's because it reproduces on so many different things. So that's why as soon as you see it there, you need to try to control it as quickly as possible and knock its numbers down as best you can. Uh, if you don't not try to knock down its numbers, then you're not going to knock down its numbers. The, the numbers are going to just stay up the rest of the year. So what, what Entrust does more than anything else is not so much kill the flies, but it keeps the adult female from ovipositing on anything that's been treated with Entrust. 
okay? And so your damage levels are gonna go down, and as your damage levels go down, there's gonna be fewer maggots that make it to adulthood, so you're gonna have fewer adults the next generation, and then fewer adults the next generation. And that's what you're looking to have, is reduced adults each generation. And because they have so many, 10 to 12 a season, uh, you're, you're gonna be able to knock that population down over time. But it is expensive, and trust is not cheap. So it, you wanna try to do the sanitation stuff first, and if that's not working, then uh, uh, use Entrust, okay? Okay, any questions about spider wing Drosophila? I must have done an outstanding job of going over everything. Yes? So where did they come from? They came from Southeast Asia. They came from China, uh, North, uh, South Korea, and Japan. But you said it's still spreading there now? Like it's, it's still spreading there, yes. So it's spreading out from there, going, it's going a little bit north, it's going south, and a little bit uh, east. Why hadn't it reached its bounds? Why, Why hadn't it reached its boundary? Is it? Uh, probably because it, it's, it, it's a new species. It is a new species. Okay. It's a new species. It's a new species for them, it's a new species for us. Okay, that's what I was uh, When I got to the, the United States, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, we heard that it was on the west coast, and then we heard that it was uh, down in Florida. But we figured it would be, you know, three or four years at least before it got up here into Maryland. And here it was the next year, it's in Maryland, and it's in Maryland very heavy. So it's one of these things uh, you need to be concerned about if you have any kind of fruit, and you need to monitor for it. That's the biggest thing I can tell you. And if anybody's interested in having a trap, I can go out to my truck after this talk and uh, get you a couple traps. You just have to supply the apple cider vinegar yourself. Okay? All right. What time is it? We'll go on. Symphylos. How many people know what symphylos? Question. I was wondering if traps uh, control them at all, just monitor. No, just monitor. Uh, people are trying to you know, 10, 20, 30 traps around in there. It captures a lot, but they just keep coming. So it just isn't enough to knock them down. Okay, some phylons and vegetable production areas. This is one of the, uh, how many people have high tunnels? Okay, you that have high tunnels are gonna have to pay a little more attention to this than other people, okay? So, so some of you, this is a real bad day for you. I'm, I'm talking about all kinds of problems. Okay, high tunnels have, have been really great over the last couple of years uh, to extend the season, both at the one end of the early and late, and they've done a great job uh, doing that, and people have made a lot of uh, uh, good money off of them. Uh, uh, soils oftentimes in high tunnels are much better shaped than the ones out in their field because we can baby the ones in the high tunnels. So we have a tendency to put in a lot of organic matter into these high tunnels, maybe a little more manure. Uh, and so the soils usually are in real good shape uh, in these high tunnels. And that's actually really good. It's good for your, your vegetables. They'll grow a lot better. But it's also real good for a, a new pest. Or not a new pest, a pest that's always been there, but now it's starting to come on. So it's not a new invasive pest. It's a new invasive pest uh, for some of our uh, uh, high tunnels, and where it wasn't a pest before. That's sort of what I mean by invasive pest. But it didn't come from anywhere else. Uh, this, is, this is a native pest. So different high tunnels. Uh, what happens over the last couple of years, especially out in western uh, Maryland, and also in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. They've started to see all kinds of, well not all kinds, but different types of problems that they couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, uh, plants, that once they, uh, the plants got fairly large, uh, they could water it all they tried and they could not keep it from wilting during the heat of the day. And they could not figure out why. And uh, fruit that didn't quite ripen up like it should, like it had a nutrient deficiency. And yet when they tested the plant, the plant tested fine as far as having uh, most of its nutrients. The soil tested fine, uh, but I should, soil tested fine, but the plant tested a little bit low in some nutrients. And this, this nutrient happens to be potassium that's low in. So potassium isn't being taken up by these plants as much. And nobody could uh, figure out why. There's other squirrely things happening to some of the uh, uh, leaf material. And again, we, we're sort of at a loss of what was happening. Plants were small and irregular, didn't grow as well as other plants, and it could be just one plant, and then everything else around it was fine. 
you know, or it could be 10 or 15 plants in a particular area, but all the plants around that are fine. So it seems to be very hit and miss what's going on in the uh, high tunnel. And what, was, what we found was that it was a garden symphyla. And garden symphylans are closely related to insects. They're not insects. They have a lot more legs than insects. And you can see the antenna is like taking little white balls and sticking them on top of each other. And so these are the antenna right here. This is the head and this is the body. Okay, the head, antenna, and the body. Uh, they're probably, these are millimeters right here. So you can see there's about, they're about six, seven millimeters long as an adult. So they're not very large little critters. Uh, here's some more pictures of them. Uh, again, the antenna, and this is the antenna up close. Okay, these are also called garden uh, centipedes, slender white, closely related to insects, 10 to 12 uh, uh, pro legs, distinct antenna. They're very fast moving, which is one reason they get the name centipedes. Centipedes are fast moving, so are these. Uh, they move up and down in the soil profile. So they move up and down during the season. They move up and down during a 24 hour period, up and down. This is what makes them so difficult to control. And they respond, uh, excuse me, I'm going through the change. Uh, they respond to soil moisture. So as that soil moisture increases in the top layers of the soil, they'll start to move up. They wanna move up towards the roots. That's sort of where they wanna be. As the, moisture, as the moisture level goes down the top three or four inches of the soil, they start to move down. Uh, and so they'll move up during the day when it's moist and they'll move down at night or vice versa, depending on when it's the most moist. So as the soil dries, they move deeper into the soil profile. And that's what another reason makes it difficult. You can treat that top six inches of soil, a foot of soil with a, a pesticide, and yet uh, most of them or a lot of them are down another foot to two feet. And so they're down below where you can get that pesticide. And so they just come right back up after that pesticide is cleared and they start to reinfest. Okay, <clears throat> they don't like light and they don't like dry soils and we know that. They occur mainly in soil with high organic matter and especially in an organic farm that fertilize with manures. So if you do a lot of fertilizing with manures or uh, any kind of organic matter, you're more likely to have this pest. The better shape your soil is in, the more likely you are to have this pest. I know it's sort of counterintuitive. And the reason they like really nice soils is because those soils have a lot of air passages and water passages. And so the symphylans move in these air passages and these water passages up and down. If they don't have these passages, they can't move up and down. So they're stuck at whatever level they're at. And this is one of the things uh, we talk about as a possible control measure is tilling the soil up in the top foot and that'll keep them from moving up any more than a, than a foot. They won't move within a foot of the top of the surface because that area has been tilled and there's no little highways for them to follow. They cannot make their own paths. They're not like earthworms. They have to follow something that's already been made for them. All right, so good soil which has fissures, micro cavities, earthworm galleries are favorable to its movement. And the movement up and down is what makes it so uh, deadly. As a seasonal and daily vertical migration between the surface can be as great as three to four feet. So they can move uh, surface all the way down to three feet and th that makes them difficult to control. Okay, spring population made up of adults only. Some violins feed on algae, fungi, and mosses. This is what they feed on most of the time. But when their populations start to get higher than what they should, they start to look around for something else to feed on and that's when they go to roots. And so they're attracted to seeds and very young roots. That's the first thing they're attracted to. And when they feed on the more mature roots, they tend to eat the absorbent hairs. So the hairs that we don't want to be bothered, the ones that do all the absorbing of the nutrients and water, those are the ones they tend to feed on. And that's why some of those plants that we saw earlier, even though there's lots of water in the soil, the absorbent hairs were gone. And so they could not take up the water. They couldn't take up the nutrients that they needed. Even though if you were to look at the roots, you probably wouldn't see much nibbling on the roots unless you looked very carefully at the, at the hairs, okay? Okay, we already went through the adults, uh, long antenna, juveniles look very much like the adults, they're just a little shorter. The eggs are kind of funky looking, 
And I'll show you that here in a bit. Uh, egg laying appears possible only at a temperature above 50 degrees. So if it's real cool, they're not gonna lay a lot of eggs. Uh, development from egg adult is kind of slow. It's about two months at 84 degrees and six months at 40 degrees. So it's not a real quick process. They only have one or two generations a year at the most. Unlike the flies we just talked about that had 10 to 12 generations a year. So this has only a very few generations. But this is what the eggs look like as some phylons. Very distinctive. Uh, the problem is you're probably never going to see these. They're going to be too far uh, in the ground. They're going to be a foot or more underground. Uh, you might, might sometimes run into them, but they're going to be hard to see because they're going to be covered in dirt. These have all been washed off. And so it's very clear to see. But you see they're kind of spiky. So they're kind of neat looking. I'm not sure how painful that was to get uh, to actually lay for the little symphylum, but it had to be a little painful, I would think. Okay, here's some damage out in the field. This is what it would look like in the field. Just, uh, just areas, just spots where the symphylums are in real high numbers, and they just wipe out all the plants in that area. This is a cornfield. They go to all kinds of plants. They don't, uh, they don't mind too much. There's only one or two plants you can grow that they don't seem to like a lot, and we'll talk about that. Uh, this is damage here. You can see this area right here is yellowing. And that's because some phylons are taking off the feeder roots and the, these plants are not getting enough nutrients here. Okay, these are the most commonly damaged plants. Broccoli, spinach, beets, onion, squash, cabbage, crucifers. Less damaged plants are tomatoes and peppers. But all the damaged plants I saw out in western Maryland uh, from some phylons were tomatoes. Okay. So just because these are less damaged plants doesn't mean they're going to be less damaged. It's just that these plants, these plants are more picked on because it's earlier in the season I think we grow a lot of these. And so the symphylons do a little bit better. So as it starts to get warmed up in these high tunnels, uh, the symphylon population is going to go down. They're just going to retreat to lower parts of the, the soil profile where it's cooler and then come back up when it starts to, uh, <coughs> starts to cool off uh, during the season. Okay, this is the damage they do, and you really don't see much, do you? <coughs> do you? Uh, on, on the roots. Uh, if you look carefully, you, you won't see any real fine hairs. All the fine hairs are gone on the spinach. Okay, and this is a little bit more damage, and you see they've done enough damage to these roots, they're actually starting to stunt the roots. The roots aren't doing well, they're not growing out. These are all in real young plants. So. If you use seeds, most of you probably don't. If you use seeds, then you can expect to see these young plants being picked on by the symphylums. If most of you use transplants, the older the transplant is, the better off it's going to be and it's more able to overcome any feeding damage. Okay, again, you see all the roots, but you don't see any real fine root hairs on any of these plants. That's because they've all been picked off. Okay, this, uh, I did not draw this picture up here. All right, a friend sent me this picture, and I can't get it off. All right, so I just have to live with it. All right, this is uh, from his high tunnel, and this is a damaged two or three plants right there. And he could not figure out what it was, and he finally dug up that area, and it was some phylons. Okay, <clears throat> damage usually concentrated in relatively small areas and recurs every season. So the infestation spread very slowly. You'll see a couple plants one year, a couple more plants the next year, maybe a bigger area the next year, and then it won't grow at all the next year, and then a bigger area. So it's very gradual, and you don't really notice it that much. Okay, in recent years, some violence have become a serious pest of young transplanted tomatoes in areas of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and the Midwest. It just seems to be moving into, not moving into our state, but the, uh, the damage that we're seeing seems to be moving more into our state. It, it, the symphylons tend to like cooler areas. So w we might be in, in good straits because of that, because we're a lot hotter. Uh, you guys out here on the eastern shore, you might run into a little bit more because you're not quite as hot as we are uh, with, your, uh, with the ocean and the waters that you have around you. Uh, but it tends, to, in Pennsylvania, it's become a major pest in their high tunnels. Uh, <clears throat> in, uh, less so in Ohio and somewhat in other Midwest states. But it's real bad in Pennsylvania right now. Okay. Now, you can monitor some violence with a, a bait, some kind of bait trap. You can use carrots or potatoes. They like either one of these two. You cut the bait in half, longitudinally scratch the surface, 
just before placing it on soil and ensure the so surface is moist. So what you want to do is moisten the soil of your high tunnel, put out these bait uh, potatoes or carrots in your high tunnel, and then go back and check after about three or four days. Just pick it up and see if you got some phylums feeding on it. Okay, so you want to put it in a depth where the, the soil's moist. I suggest that you go ahead and water your area uh, <clears throat> so you can bring some phylums up if they're present, okay? Okay, this is what it would look like. You want to cut it longitudinally, lay it on. You can cut it just like this. It'll last longer if you leave the skin on the top of it and you put it into the soil. Okay, you need uh, at least a dozen baits in the field. Most of our fields I would not tell you to bother with. Most of our fields are not in that great a shape compared to our high tunnel soils. So it seems, this seems to be much more of a pest in our high tunnels. And we, we really baby our, our uh, vegetables in the high tunnels. We fertilize them and water them really well. <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, the, the some phylums do that much better in there. Okay, so uh, examine the, uh, the cut surface of that two to five days. Detect and consider treatment. If large numbers are detected more than 20 per bait station, consider pre-plant fumigation. And we'll talk a little bit about that, some fumigation you can use <clears throat> uh, organically. Uh, some people like to use it's a shovel method and they'll go through it and look for them. Uh, the, the way I discovered it, uh, people sent me soil samples from out west in uh, Garrett County and Washington County. And I, I got the samples and I started going through the, the soil and I started seeing some phylums, which are not a, it's not a real big deal. You usually see some phylums in every soil. But where I normally see two or three some phylums per shovelful, I've seen 15 to 20 per shovelful. And then some spots, 50 per shovelful. <clears throat> and that is just way too many. So once you get above two or three, up to about five in a shovelful, you've got way too many, okay? So five is sort of the cutoff point. Okay, you wanna reduce the amount of undecomposed plant material and manure that's applied to the soil. So if this is something you're doing organically in your high tunnel, it's a real good thing to do for your soil. It's not a good thing for some phylums. So that's why you need to know if you have some phylums or not. If you don't have them, continue doing this. If you start to see them, all right, we continue doing this, but maybe back off in the manure a little bit, okay? Tillage, physically kills some phylums and dries out the top one to three inches of soil. So tillage always seems to help reduce their numbers in the top of the soil, keeps them away from the root. Okay. Crop rotation uh, can help. The two crops that seem to, ironically, seem to work are the potato crop and the spring oats cover crop. So you could uh, plant a spring oats cover crop in your high tunnel, and that would help lower, lower the numbers if you have a lot of them in your high tunnel. Okay. Size of the plants. So the bigger the plant, the, the more able it is to fend off uh, attack. You can increase plant density. Uh, if fest soil can be treated with insecticide. I know nobody here is gonna use insecticide. So we'll go, uh, oh. <clears throat> Okay, I'm gonna talk about it here the invasive nematode problems. Okay, any questions about some phylums? Yes? If they're not able to make their own paths in the soil, how do they get to the plants that are going to be the hairs? How do they get to the hairs? Yeah. They're, they're gonna follow some pathway, uh, whether it's an earthworm pathway, whether it's a path, pathway that microorganisms have made, or some other pathway. Real good tilth soil has all these pathways in it. It's on a microscopic, it's a very small scale, but the, these pathways exist all the time. And once they reach the root, then they just start to go down the side of the root and follow the hairs. Yes? Where do they fit into like, the soil food web mix? Like, do they have any predators or what balances them? Oh, what kind of predators do they have? And th yeah, they have a couple predators. It, it's, it's just like anything else. Uh, the, the, if the environment favors their reproduction, favors their survival, predators can't knock them back. And that's uh, a newly introduced pest has that. It doesn't have as many predators. The environment is just perfect for it, and so it explodes in, in numbers. And so that's what's happening with the symphylans. Uh, the the uh, type of environment we have in the uh, high tunnel makes it very successful. And so the predators just can't keep up with it. Does it have anything to do with uh, the fact that it's not in the normal climate or not? 
Yeah, uh, it probably does. They are able to come up into it a little bit sooner. And it's also because of things I talked about before that we, we tend to have really nice soil tilth in our high tunnels by adding organic matter and, and a lot of manure. And if you add a lot of manure out in your field, you still have to contend with all that other stuff. But if you add a lot of manure in this small area, it starts to have a real uh, effect on the soil profile. Yes? How does it go over winter? It overwinters deeper in the soil. So it'll go down three or four feet. Overwinters down there. It just stays quiescent. Which you can't tell it out. No, you can't tell it out. One, one, of the, one way I've seen, which is really intensive, uh, they did want to move the high tunnel, so they dug out all the soil in the top three feet. They put in a sand layer of about six inches and then put all the soil back in. And so that sand layer kept the symphylins from moving up. Again, there's no little, every time there was a little fissure in the sand layer, the sand just closed in on it again. So it was able to, to uh, keep the symphylins out for a while. Eventually, it, roots are going to get down there and start to open that up, and then they'll follow the roots up. Okay. All right, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. How many people have garlic? Probably not many of you. Okay, a few of you. Boy, you've been hit with all these, I, I noticed today. Okay, <clears throat> garlic bulb nematode, it's called a garlic bloat nematode, first appeared during the wet year of 2009 in the confirmed case in New York and Vermont. It's now in New Hampshire, Maine, and Pennsylvania. We're pretty sure it's already here in Maryland and Delaware. Okay, this is an old pest, but we've gotten rid of it over the years and has not been much of a pest. Uh, not, you know, I'm not going to read all this, but it basically came in from Canada, we think, on, on seed that should not have been used in garden, but it was. And it was in the seed, and it was, seed was planted. They started to make more garlic from it, started to give the way of garlic, and then it just started to spread like that. Okay, this is uh, what the nematode looks like. It's microscopic. This is what the nematode looks like on a root. And it's been dyed red, so you can see it more easily. And you see that there's literally hundreds of them on the root. <clears throat> and this is what will do the damage. So they'll use their, over, uh, they'll use their mouth parts and stick it into the root and start to draw out nutrients. Okay, leaves, severely infected plants turn yellow, dry prematurely. Plants may be stunted. Roots may be missing, especially on one side of the bulb. I'll show you some pictures of that. The basal plate appears to have a dry rot, similar to Fusarium basal uh, plate rot. And so this is what a lot of people think they have is, is a disease, and they probably do, but it's because of the nematode that it's so much worse. Okay, Lee, okay. Uh, balls may crack with dark rings, infested tissue predisposes the plant to other problems like Fusarium or white rot. So what happens is you look at your bulbs and you see a lot of white rot, a lot more than you would expect. And it's because of the nematode, not because especially of the disease. Okay. Garlic boat nematodes can overwinter in soil. Crop debris and can move uh, into the inflorescence, into the seeds, and remain in the seeds for long periods of time in some plant species. Okay, this is some of the damage it'll do. It'll start to rot some of the bulbs. This is what normal garlic should look like. This is what the damage from the bloat nematode will look like. Sometimes it can be a much more subtle than this. You can see how half the plate on this, the roots are missing, the other half is fine. And it can be something just that subtle, as opposed to some more damage that looks like this. Okay, so you see a lot of my pictures came from Ontario, and that's because they have a real problem with it. Okay. These seed plants that can, uh, the, the nematodes can transfer from garlic include beans, clover, alfalfa, which act as a major source of the nematodes dispersal. So the nematodes can move to these other plants and then they move into the seed and then we plant the seed and we start the whole bloat nematode problem again. <clears throat> Migration to above ground plant parts usually occurs with rain or sprinkler irrigation. So the nematodes are located in the ball when it starts to rain, they start to come up with that rain because it's moisture and they're not going to dry out. So then they come up to the inflorescence and they start to infest the, the seed. Okay. Uh, nematodes enter tissues through stomata by direct penetration. Fourth stage is the survival stage, which can go a cryptobiosis, hidden life, on or in the plant tissue and survives three to five years. So this fourth stage 
can stay around for a long period of time in this fourth stage. It can stay in dry plant material. People think they dry out their, their garlic or, or they have real dry seeds, so this is going to cut back on the numbers. It does not reduce the numbers of the nematodes by drying it out. All right, this is some more damage to the bulb. Don't confuse this with onion maggot damage. Onion maggots, you can see the maggots. Uh, nematodes, you can't see the nematodes. Okay. Uh, nematodes live for a fairly long time when they're sexually mature. <coughs> uh, about 75 days. Now that fourth instar is not sexually mature, so it can live a much longer period of time. But once it becomes mature and it's a female, then she'll start to lay eggs and she doesn't live as long. Okay? So a female can produce two to 500 eggs. I'm gonna skip over some of this. Uh, nematodes can survive in soil for as long as two years without principal host. So they can be in a soil for a long period of time. That's why you have to think about a long rotation if you have this. Four stage juveniles enter young tissues, especially in seedlings when below the soil surface. Okay, this is a nematode feeding right here. You see this is the root tip. This is its mouth part, and this is its stylet, little stabby thing that's going to go into the root. Okay. If you've purchased or bought any new planting material in the last few years, because we've gone back and we found out this, the material was infested three or four years ago, from, and, you bought, and it came from Ontario or New York, you may have this pest. Okay. If you have not made any new introductions, why you are pro then you're probably safe. If you have not made any new introductions in the last three or four years, and especially if you've not made it fr from garlic that's come from Ontario or New York, you're probably safe. Right? You, uh, you mostly want to find out if you have this. If you have this, you're going to have to rotate from any allium crops like garlic, onions, and leeks for about, uh, and control the nightshades, because it will get up in the nightshades for about four years. Okay, keep fields of garlic grown moist. I'm going to let you read this. Anything I want to pick out? And we're going to talk about a little bit about biofumigant. Uh, mustard produces isothiocyanate, a natural gas released from all brassica plant tissues. Uh, over the last uh, probably 10, 20 years, we've sort of uh, uh, bred the, the high levels of, the, of this material, of this chemical isothiocyanate. Uh, in order to get the, the release of the chemical into the soil, you need to chop up the plants as much as possible. Okay? You can't just simply plow it under. It won't release the chemical to any great extent. It has to be chopped up as much as possible. Uh, mustard plants must be chopped as finely as possible before immediately incorporating the soil. Simply plowing doesn't help. Uh, this is other things you should consider. Okay, we're going. They do a lot of this in uh, Europe and England where they use the, the, uh, uh, the, the mustards as a biofumicant. So they grow the mustards, uh, then they chop them up, and this is what this does. It chops them up very finely, and then it plows them uh, under the surface, about uh, four to six inches deep. And they want, that, they want them to stay right in that four to six inch layer, because that's where the gas is going to be given off. And they want this to be a little bit moist, so that it seals the gas inside as, as the plant releases it. Okay, this is what sort of happens. This is an unbroken cell. This is the enzyme that's in the cell. This is the glucosinolate. And when you break that cell apart, these two come in contact. And when it comes in contact with water, it creates this isothiocyanate. And this is a biofumigant. This is the same thing that vapam uh, gives off. Same chemical. All right. If you had 7,000 pounds of dry matter, of rash, you would produce equivalent of 160 nanomoles of this isothiocyanate per gram of soil. Uh, the amount of isothiocyanate released by a standard application of metam sodium would be greater than 2,000. So you can see there's quite a difference between here. You're releasing much smaller amounts of this, and that's why you only want it in the top four, six inches. You don't want to put it through the whole soil profile because you just will not be able to release enough chemical from that plant. All right. So this has actually worked pretty well uh, to reduce nematode and disease problems uh, that are not real severe. And so you want to discover if you have a disease or nematode problems as early on as possible, and then use this as a cover crop, chop it up real finely, and then plow it under uh, only about four to six inches deep, and then let it sit. 
for about two to three weeks, and then you'll be ready to go. Okay.